So, <clears throat> you ready? I'm ready. Okay. The first question today. If a person attempts or succeeds to commit suicide, and they've given their life, life to Christ prior, is it still a willful act of turning their backs on God and unforgivable? Or is it a sin to be faced at judgment? I haven't been able to find definitive scripture that wholly states one way or the other, at least in my limited knowledge. So what's the answer? All right, no, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a question that's asked uh, many times and it's been asked for years. And I was actually raised in a denomination that would say the answer is uh, it's unforgivable and you're condemned and that's the end of you. Uh, I would totally disagree with that, however, uh, now that I know better. But there's really four questions here. And they are, is it a willful act? Is it unforgivable? Is it a sin? And we'll, we face judgment for it. And the answers are simply yes, no, yes, and no. So that clears that up, I hope. <laughs> no. Okay. Is it a willful act? Yes. Obviously it is. We take matters into our own hands and uh, we'll do away with ourselves. So it is a willful act. Is it unforgivable? Of course not. And we'll, we'll all extrapolate on that a little bit as we go along. Is it a sin? Sure, it's a sin. Anytime we do something that God has told us not to do, and he has told us not to commit murder, and that's what suicide is, uh, it's a sin. Yeah. And will it be faced at judgment? And the answer to that is no. And I'm going to give you some, some scripture to explain this. Hmm. But first I'd like you to look at, uh, in John chapter 6, uh, verses 37 through 40. And what we're going to do here with this question is we're going to demonstrate for you the principle of biblical interpretation that says Scripture interprets Scripture. And what that means is uh, if you come to a passage that implies something but it's rather vague, uh, you need to go to other places in Scripture that deal with the subject and make it clear. Now, there's no scripture in the Bible that uses the word suicide. It uses the words sin. Okay? And that's all suicide is. It's a sin, just like any other sin. Because, again, God has told us not to do that. But, is it unforgivable, and will we forfeit our place in heaven if we do that? Well, listen to what Jesus says here in John chapter 6, verses 37 through 40. He says, all that the Father gives me, and he's talking about us, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven to do, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Now that's pretty emphatic, is it not? There's no caveats in there. There are no qualifiers in there to say except for this sin or that sin or some other sin. And the issue of judgment, Jesus deals with also in uh, John chapter 5, uh, verse 24, and again, it's very straightforward. Jesus says, truly, truly. Now, when you're reading your New Testament, uh, whenever you see a repeated words like that, truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say, that's for emphasis. Saying, and what he's saying is, this is absolutely true. So, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. So when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have passed from judgment into life. We are no longer judged for our sins because we have Christ who intercedes for us and has paid the penalty of our sins. So there is no judgment for the Christian to face. Uh, we've talked before about uh, we'll be judged uh, for to see what rewards we get, but we won't be judged for our sins because they're covered by the blood of Christ. And then in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 through 16, uh, we, read the, we read these words. Since we then have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So you see, as Christians, we can come before God and we are going to receive mercy and we're going to receive grace. We are not going to receive judgment because that was taken care of at the cross. So, is uh, suicide a sin? Yes. Uh, would I advise against it? Yes. Uh, having been in the ministry for over 30 years, have I seen instances where I understood why people have done it? Yes. Uh, I, I can say that. And <clears throat> the fact is, God takes them to be with Him at that moment. Uh, so, I would advise against it, but it's not an unforgivable sin. There is no such thing. How's that? I liked it. That, okay. you know, it's a, I think it's a wonderful answer. I just hope nobody is thinking about anything like that. Yeah, well, I would too. Um, okay, next question. And this is, a, this is a great question because this is a question that bothers a lot of uh, the younger believers. Do you have to be baptized to go to heaven? No, you do not. Uh, you are baptized not to go to heaven, but because you are going to heaven. You see, your, your ticket, so to speak, is punched before you ever become baptized. Okay? You're baptized not to be a Christian. You're baptized because you are a Christian. And you just have to keep the, the horse out there uh, in front of the cart. Now, when we, again, when we look in Scripture, we find that uh, where baptism is talked about, it is always preceded by faith. Uh, for instance, in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, when Jesus says, Go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey uh, everything I've commanded you, we see a sequence of events, don't we? Go into all the world and do what? Make disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple, by definition, is a follower of Christ. So you make disciples and then you baptize them. Okay? That's the sequence. We see it again repeated in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, uh, where Peter preaches his great sermon, the first sermon uh, of the church age. And the people are, are struck by the sermon, and they cry out to Peter, and they say, well, what shall we do? And he says to them, repent and be baptized. What is repentance? It's placing your faith in Jesus Christ. And so again, we see that sequence of events. And it's always that way. Uh, Another example that, that people sometimes point to is the story in Luke chapter 23, verse 41 through 43, where Jesus is being crucified and you have the two criminals on either side of him and one of them sort of mocks Jesus and the other one says, you know, he's an innocent man. Lord, what can I do? And I'm paraphrasing now. And Jesus says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Uh, so one believed in Christ, the other did not. Neither one of them had opportunity to be baptized. Uh, Jesus says, doesn't matter. You believed, therefore, today upon your death, you will be with me in paradise or in heaven, uh, as the case may be. Uh, sometimes it gets a little stickier. There is a verse in 1 Peter, but again, this is one obscure verse where Peter is talking and he says um, that baptism now saves us. Okay. But what he's saying, he's already talking to believers. If you read chapter 1 of 1 Peter, you find that the book is addressed to believers. And by the way, almost the epistles are universally uh, addressed to believers. So we need to remember that. So he's saying, when he says baptism now saves us, it's like me saying to you, uh, this wedding ring makes me a very happy man. Okay. You all know what I mean, right? Now, the wedding ring does nothing to make me sad, happy, or anything else. But it's a symbol of the fact that my wife makes me a very happy man. And that's what Peter was saying there. He's using symbolism, you see. And, and the, the wedding ring is a great analogy of baptism. Because what does the wedding ring do? Does it make me more married than if I didn't have it on? No, of course not. Uh, does, but what it does is, it's a symbol that says to the world, I am married. Okay? And that's what baptism is. It's our outward expression of our inward faith that says to the world, we are married, if you will, 
to Christ. We are united with Christ. We are Christians and we want the whole world to know that. And so that's what baptism is. It's an outward symbol of an inward faith. That's why in, in Scripture we have no record of, of uh, adults being baptized without first expressing faith in Christ. And that's uh, the way that is. Now there's, there's some, I might just add, they didn't actually, didn't actually ask this question, whoever turned it in, uh, but I often get it when I'm doing church membership classes and things, and that is, well, what about the mode of baptism? Uh, what is, is, you know, some churches sprinkle and some churches pour and some pour churches immerse. And which one is valid? Uh, people want to know that. Well, I'm a little bit of a heretic in Baptist circles uh, because I think they're all valid. Uh, because I believe God looks on the inside, not the outside. So if you were sprinkled in a Presbyterian church, I think that's just fine with, with God. He's interested in your heart, not so much the mode. Now, if you're baptized by me, it will be by immersion because I think that, uh, the, again, the symbolism is you go down in the water, you're buried to your sins, you're, you're raised with Christ to new life. And I, I think that's the pattern we see in the New Testament. Uh, interesting to me how, uh, how things develop. I think there's a slide here for you. And these are what some, some of the great uh, fathers of the church have said over the years. Uh, the first one is Martin Luther, and uh, he said this, I would have those who are to be baptized be entirely immersed, as the word imports and the mystery signifies. Now it's interesting, uh, Martin Luther, of course, is uh, the uh, patriarch of the Lutheran Church. That's what he says, but the Lutheran Church doesn't immerse, they sprinkle. I don't know how that evolved, but it did. Next one is John Calvin. The word baptized signifies to immerse. It is certain that immersion was the practice of the ancient church. And uh, the Reformed churches would claim Calvin as, as their uh, father of their church. And yet they sprinkle. They don't immerse. And then finally John Wesley. Uh, buried with him alludes to baptizing by immersion according to the custom of the first church and of course Wesley would be the father of the Methodist church and they sprinkle and don't immerse so how, how they came to that I don't know uh, and by the way uh, baptize is uh, simply a Greek word that's transliterated into English you know, there's translation where you take a, a foreign word and you put it, use the English counterpart. Transliteration is where you take a foreign word and you just re-spell it uh, in the English language. And that's what it is. Uh, baptizo is the Greek word. Baptize is the English spelling of it. And the reason it came out that way is because there was too much uh, conflict over how to do it. Baptizo means, as, as these guys correctly point out, to immerse or to dip. Uh, so instead of translating it to dip or immerse, they just transliterated it and let everybody come to their own conclusion because that way when I sell Bibles, I can sell them to Methodists and Presbyterians and Baptists and oh, I'll see how that goes. Very spiritual. You know what? <laughs> I like that. It, it, it explains a lot of things. Uh, uh, um, okay, next question. You know, this one's actually really good, too, because, you know, people often say, I'm going to heaven, and they're looking skyward. So, is there any scripture that supports where heaven and hell are? Well, obviously. It's Washougal. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'll leave, it to, church, I'll leave right? it to you to determine which one. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, there really isn't a, a scripture that nails it down as a place. And I really don't think that it is a geographical location at all. I think heaven, to be in heaven is to be with God. And to be in hell is to be where God is not. And that's certainly going to be hell. Now, the reason we think of heaven and hell as places is because that's the way we think. That's the way our minds process things. And because of the, the original Hebrew cosmology. Uh, there's a verse in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, I believe it is, where Paul makes mention of someone going to the third heaven. And what he's doing there, you remember Paul was a Jew, he, he, and he's going back and, and 
doing this Hebrew cosmology, and I think I have a slide of that if it comes out well. I don't, yeah, that looks pretty good. This is a, the, the Hebrew cosmology and the way they thought of things. Now remember, uh, they didn't have the science we have. And uh, so they're not going to be quite as up on it as we are. But this is the way they thought things were. And there were three heavens. And the first heaven was right here. And that's where the clouds are and the birds are and all that sort of thing. And the second heaven was up here where the stars are in the sky. And then the third heaven is above all that where God is. And then they have Sheol down here, which is the Hebrew word that we translate hell. And so that's where we get that God is up there and hell is down there. But if the earth is round, as we know it to be now, up there and down there depends on what part of the earth you're on. So how can that be? So they really aren't physical places, I don't believe. I think anywhere that we are with God, physically in proximity with Him, as we will be when we die and we're taken to heaven, wherever that is, that will be heaven because, not because it's a place, but because God is there and now our relationship with him is full. And of course, hell uh, would be uh, the opposite of that. And if you notice, if you read the scriptures, we're not told very much about heaven. And I know there have been a lot of books written on it, but if you actually read scripture, there's not very much in there about what heaven is. is. And I think that's because it is so wonderful and so magnificent that we can't comprehend it anyway. I, I think it's so otherworldly, if you will. So it's so foreign. It's going to be so wonderfully foreign to what we can imagine that God didn't bother to try to explain it to us. He just says, I'm going to be there. And I think last time we did this, we touched on the scripture where Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's going to be heaven to be present with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow. I like that. I like that explanation. I actually like, like that map, too. That's pretty neat. I'll sell it to you. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, next question is one that bothers a lot of people, and, and I know that I've thought about this. Uh, where did the children of Adam and Eve get their spouses? If they married and had children with their brothers and sisters... That's incest, which is a sin and violates the law, right? That's under Leviticus 20.17. The, you know, the additional question to that is, if God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, wouldn't it still be wrong even if it was before the law? Yeah, those are good questions. They, they puzzle people. And a lot of it is going to depend on uh, your views about creation and so on and so forth. But if you believe... Uh, historically, as, as historical Christianity has believed that Adam and Eve were real people and God created them and they were the first people on the earth and then they had children, that question comes up all the time. Uh, over the years, people want to know where, where, where did uh, Cain get his wife? Well, the, the obvious answer and the only answer is he had to marry one of his siblings. It's that simple. Now, we, we, we're repulsed at that. Okay, uh, because it's been illegal for as long as we can think about. But uh, the reason, the legal rationale behind not being able to marry uh, your, your first cousin, your sister, etc., is we all know now it's because of the genetic thing and uh, the gene pool shrinks and, and the children are then much more prone uh, to have physical and mental problems. That's why we see uh, in the Middle Ages and before where we had dynasties and kingships and they often married their sisters and brothers and so on and so forth to keep the throne in the family that you end up producing some pretty strange acting folks. Well, that's why. Yeah. So, but we didn't have that problem in the very beginning. It hadn't developed yet, as far as we know. I, mean, I, I can't authoritatively say that, but I have to assume that. And God doesn't hold us responsible for things we don't know. So now again, depending on when you date creation, it it's, can be thousands of years before the law was given. I, I think if you use Bishop Usher's chronology, it's 500 years. That's the shortest one. So, God is not going to hold us responsible 
or Cain, in this case, responsible for doing something that he didn't tell anybody not to do until hundreds or thousands of years later. Okay. And again, when we are talking about the, the creation and getting started, that's a unique circumstance. It's much different than our circumstance now. Uh, they didn't have opportunity to marry anybody else. I mean, we do. Um, so I, I would say that the most honest intellectual answer is, intellectually honest answer is, if you believe Adam and Eve were real people and the Bible account of creation, you have to believe Cain married a sister. Well, that explains it. You know, uh, um, <clears throat> the next question is actually kind of precedes that one. And, you know, I mean, if, and I mean, at least from creation, was Eve the first woman? There are books written uh, the same time as books in the Old Testament that state she was preceded by a woman named Lilith. What, what's the story on that? <laughs> well, Lilith is, a, is a, a myth that lives on. And I don't know about books written at the same time as that. Lilith, the, the Lilith thing didn't become popular for many years later. But as with all myths, the, one of the things about myths that keeps them uh, vibrant, if you will, uh, they change over time and they change with who's telling them and so on and so forth. So uh, one of the myths that has caught on, oh, probably really caught on and was resurrected in the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, with the radical uh, feminist movement, they latched on to one of the stories of Lilith. And there are, there are several about her, but the one they latched on to goes like this. Adam was created out of the, the dirt, and Lilith was created out of the dirt, equal to Adam, where Eve was created out of Adam's rib, subordinate to Adam. So the radical feminist, of course, like Lilith better, because she's equal to Adam. So what happened was, she being equal to him, uh, was a powerful woman, an independent woman, and she uh, acted so, and Adam didn't like it because he was a male chauvinist pig, and <laughs> they, they, they got into this, this big fight, and she takes off, and she leaves him, and she's tracked down by three angels. And uh, they try to get her to go back to Adam, and she won't do it because she's an independent woman and she's going to do her own thing. And uh, anyway, away she goes, and then God makes this uh, subordinate, little, meek, mild uh, woman by the name of Eve uh, to be Adam's wife. But, of course, it sort of begs the question, if she was so meek and mild and subordinate to Adam, uh, why did uh, she eat the apple and then have Adam eat it too? Yeah, I don't know. So th that's one, and there are several. Uh, the Assyrians uh, thought that Lilith was a demon, and that she was a demon involved in the deaths of infants. And, and also in that first scenario, that was her punishment. Uh, the, the angels banished her, and she was to become a demon of death. Now again, you think about it, and you think, well, that sounds kind of silly, but even to this day, we struggle scientifically sometimes with what we call infant, sudden infant death syndrome, don't we? Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can't explain it. Uh, we, we're much better at it now than we were then. Now, then they had no way to explain it, so they blamed it on Lilith, this demon that goes around and, and looks for babies uh, to kill. And it's interesting to me, though, in the myth, uh, she kills indiscriminately male and female babies. If she didn't like the guys, why didn't she just kill male babies? I don't know, but she didn't. So, as superstitions go, the Jews were very superstitious people, and uh, what they did, they came up with this uh, amulet, and this, on this amulet, they had written Lilith Abai, and Lilith Abai simply means Lilith, stay away. Okay. And what they would do is, in their baby room, they would hang this, this amulet that says Lilith Abai. If you say that fast enough, enough times, you can convolute that into lullaby. And that's where that word comes from. A lullaby is something you sing to your babies, you know, to, to soothe them and quiet them and make them feel better. Well, that's what this amulet was. You held it out there to keep her away. Now, it is interesting, uh, the name comes up once in the Bible. And you can, you can find it uh, in Isaiah 34, verse 14. And chapter 34 of Isaiah is a real 
downer of a chapter. Isaiah's going on and on about what it's going to be like when God visits judgment upon these people, and, and it's really bad. So, uh, in the New English Standard Version, it translates the verse this way. And wild animals shall meet with hyenas, the wild goat shall cry to his fellow. Indeed, there the night bird settles and finds for herself a resting place. Now, that doesn't really jump out at us too much. Uh, but if you read this same thing in, in the New American Standard Version, uh, which is the most word-for-word -word accurate version we, we have today, uh, it says, there the night monster meets. And if you read it in the King James Version, it says, there the night demon. Uh, so Lilith, the one place she shows up, not very good. It's just a myth like any other myth. There's lots of them out there. Yeah, well, that, you know, and that's one of the things that happens is I think, you know, people who don't want to believe grab onto other stuff to try that's, to, to that's exactly right. prove things are not true. Um, this is a good question, and, and it deals with, with the terminology. What's the difference between Orthodox and Protestant? Yeah, that is an interesting question, and, and I'm not 100% sure just what the person was asking. If, if they're asking the difference between uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Protestant Church, or if they're asking about Orthodoxy uh, versus what uh, Protestants uh, teach. Um, Orthodoxy has become a term uh, that simply means what has historically accurately been. So we are orthodox in our teaching about Jesus, as far as the Protestant church goes here at Parkside Church. But I don't think that's what they're asking. I think what they're asking is, what is the difference between the Orthodox church and the other churches? And, and really, uh, the question wouldn't be Orthodox and Protestant. It would be what is the difference between Orthodox and Catholic? Because they're, they're close together. And you know, we teach a lot about the Reformation here and talk about the Reformation and how Martin Luther you know, in, in instigated the Reformation. And that was the first big church split. You know, we talk about how before then everybody was Catholic and now we had Catholics and Protestants, okay? Well, actually, the first big church split came officially in 1054 when the Eastern Orthodox Church split from the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? And it, it was really a tragedy uh, that never should have happened. And, and if you look at how it developed over time, it's a whole bunch of little things that caused a terrible disruption. And isn't that the way it goes in our marriages and in our, our society today and in different groups, even in our churches today? You'll see little things begin to crop up and people will begin to divide over these little things and take sides and pretty soon you, you have a big division. Now when we look at the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church, uh, we see a lot of similarities a lot more than we see differences. And by the way, if you want to do something really fun, you just happen to live in the right spot, every spring over in Portland, there's a huge Eastern Orthodox Church in Northeast Portland. And they have a, this big celebration every spring. And if you've never gone, uh, I recommend it highly. You get some great history, great food, and it's, just, it's a good time. It's a good place to take your kids to and show them how other people worship. Uh, but what happened uh, between the Orthodox Church and the Protestant Church is they, they began to drift apart about, about 300. Because in about 300, the Western Church uh, began to talk about uh, something called the, the Bishop of Rome. And they began to talk about Rome as being the capital, and, whereas before it was Constantinople. And Constantinople, uh, Jerusalem, Alexandria, Constantinople would all fall in that group. And then there was Rome and, and uh, all the Western world. And as they began to drift, uh, the Roman Church adopted Latin as its language, and the Eastern Church adopted Greek. And over time, the, Lat the Roman church lost its ability to speak Greek because they weren't interested in it. And likewise, over in Constantinople because they weren't interested in Latin. So now the two had a harder time communicating. And, and things just began to develop differently. Uh, in the Western church, they believed certainly in the deity of Christ. 
but their emphasis was on the humanity of Christ. That's why you see Christ always depicted as a human being and hanging on a cross and all that's true and good and that was their emphasis where the Eastern Church emphasized the deity of Christ and more of the mystery in that. That's why in the Orthodox Church there's a lot of incense and a lot of stuff, a lot of mystery going on and there's reasons behind all that uh, because that's where they look. And even in the, in the communion time uh, the Western Church, which naturally we are an outflow of that church, they celebrated communion using unleavened bread, as was done at the Last Supper. The Eastern Church used leavened bread because they said it represented the fact that Christ rose. And leaven's what makes the bread rise, you see. So, now that seems like an awfully small thing, doesn't it, to us? And just like most of our arguments that destroy marriages and homes and churches and businesses and all that, they start with a lot of very small things. See? So uh, they just continued to drift, continued to drift. And then in, in 476, uh, Alaric comes in and sacks Rome. Well, that really weakened the Western Church. Uh, so uh, the Eastern Church kind of began to come to prominence. Okay? Well, Jeez. Wow. I guess that wasn't good. <laughs> Almost like a commentary. Huh? Almost, yeah. So, so as the Eastern Church begins to gain power, the Western Church wants to compensate for that. You know how we are as people. We all want to protect our own little turf. So Gregory, in 590, is appointed the first official bishop of Rome. And that's considered the first pope. And what he called himself was the first among equals. Uh, so uh, that didn't set real well uh, with Constantinople. Well, then as the Western Church continues to look west, which in, in their geography would have been Europe, uh, and they begin to uh, move into what we know as Germany and France and those sort of places, there's a guy, one of my favorite guys in history, uh, because his name is Pippin the Short. <laughs> So I love Pippin the Short. And Pippin the Short uh, is nobody to be messed with and he's the king of the Franks. And what he wants to do is he wants to curry favor with the Catholic Church. And so he gives to the Catholic Church uh, land and monasteries and churches and things and just deeds it over to him. And in history,